Hello and welcome to another episode of Katie the Science Lady. I'm Mrs. Jacobson and today we're talking about dinosaurs. I'm just kidding, we're talking about the fossil record and biogeography, but I get really excited talking about dinosaurs. So let's learn together. Okay, y'all, we're going to talk about the fossil record and biogeography today, which is kind of fun because we get to talk a little bit about dinosaurs, kind of barely. Um, but in the background here, you can see um, the fossil of a dinosaur known as the Archaeopteryx. Um, it had wings, which you can kind of see here, looked like they're made of feathers. Um, and this was a fairly recent discovery. Um, and by recent, I mean in the past like 40 years, <laughs> which is not that recent for most of you. Um, but in, as far as fossils go, um, that's pretty recent. So we're going to talk about how we can use these things to um, show evolution or change over time and how we can use them as evidence for that. So fossils give us information about the structures and habitats of ancient organisms. It can also give us information about what they ate um, because you can sometimes see that in the way that their teeth are formed, um, their claws, beaks, things like that. It also shows us how organisms have changed over time. This is essentially evolution. Evolution as a biological concept is talking about the change in the physical um, traits and alleles of a species or a population over time. So yes, we're looking at change over time, but we're looking at an entire population of organisms, not just one single person or one single animal um, or one single plant. We're looking at how their whole group, their whole population changes over time. So we can find fossils um, all over the globe, and I'm sure you've seen um, some movies about fossils or movies about archaeologists before, um, but we find these fossils, um, archaeologists dig them up, and they kind of can reconnect them um, and give us an idea of what these creatures could have looked like or what they may have looked like. Now, there are missing links. The fossil record is by no means perfect because the actual creation of a fossil is kind of difficult. It takes a lot of very specific conditions for those bones um, to, to kind of calcify and turn into rock, basically. So it takes a lot of specific things. But we do have transitional fossils, which are showing intermediate stages and evolution from ancient species to modern ones. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples. But we're basically looking at those stepping stones in between an old species that probably doesn't exist anymore and a species that exists today. Because that's what we really want to see is where did all these different species come from? Who was their ancestor? And now new fossils are constantly being discovered, but we still have really big gaps in our fossil record. It's not perfect. Um, and that's just because we haven't had a lot of time yet. Now, we do have um, some of these phases here between the Yanornis. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that right, but I like saying Yanornis. It makes me happy, which looks basically like a really strange goose. Um, and this lived about 120 to 110 million years ago. So they found fossils for this species about that long ago. We also have a Velociraptor, which are of Jurassic Park fame, um, which was only about 83 million years ago, which might confuse you a little bit. I did not flip those around. The Velociraptor technically um, would be younger than the Yanornis, which is looking like a modern goose. So there's a little bit of confusion here. These do tend to have some things in common, um, but we need to have more transitional fossils to really show us um, these kind of different phases because these look like completely different organisms, even though they may share a lot of similar features. We also have the Archaeopteryx, like we see on the background of our slides here, and that was about 155 to 150 million years ago. So what this may indicate to us, and again, this is an indication, is that both the Yanornis, the kind of modern looking goose, and the Velociraptor may have been related to this Archaeopteryx um, as its common ancestor, which is a little bit crazy. Um, but that's why we need a lot of these transitional fossils to kind of visualize the changes that may have occurred um, to get from this kind of bird-like reptilian creature to the Velociraptor and this goose, basically. I'm going to call it a goose because it kind of looks like a goose. Now, sometimes it's a little more linear. We can see it a little bit better. Um, we have the Pachycetus, which was a four-legged creature that kind of walked on land, to the Ambulus natans, which is going to have some webbed features, um, but look very, very similar in the structure of the head shape, um, a lot of other bone features. 
And then to the Basilosaurus, which looks kind of like a whale. And you can see it's got tiny little, uh, you probably can't see it, but there's tiny little back flippers there um, that are pretty much useless at that point. So that's what we'll call a vestigial structure. And in modern whales, you'll actually see the remnants of those bones, but there are no use for them. So it indicates that those um, are what we have now are commonly known as whales, but they may have come from a land creature at some point. I mean, we're talking 52 million years, so it's kind of a long time for this change to happen. There are a couple of patterns by which the fossil record can be looked at. The first one we look at is gradualism. This one is one that makes a lot of sense to me. It just kind of helps my brain. It makes my brain happy because it's showing us a slow, steady rate from something that's more ancient to something that's more modern. Um, this pattern, gradualism, it makes sense. It's gradual, the change. There are lots of transitional fossils. So here, let's look at an example. We start with this older version, much smoother of a shell um, and whatever creature would live inside of there. This is kind of an illustration. And over time, it shifts to a different type of shell. So this would be an example of gradualism, something changing very slowly over time. We can tell how it got from one thing to another thing um, because there's many of those in-between steps or transitional fossils found. And this does occur with some of the things that we see, um, but not everything. So that's why it can be tricky to always try to apply gradualism um, as a pattern. It doesn't always work. The second pattern is called punctuated equilibrium. This we see quite a bit. Um, it's basically a pattern of rapid change, so quick change, followed by a period of no change, stasis. So it could be due to a catastrophic event, something causes a specific type of organism to survive better, um, and then it stays that way for a long time. Or it could just be that we don't have the in-between fossils, and we can't call it gradualism because we don't have transitional fossils. So here is the example picture for this one. So we have uh, what we see over here found in the rock layers. So this would be older, this would be younger rock layers at the top. We see these the small shells for some reason. They were good to go for a long period of time. There weren't that many. Um, you can see right here stasis. So it was all small shells. Then right around this time, we see that there may have been a mutation and these longer shells started to appear as well. Then something happened, probably, maybe something that caused the small shells to die out. But after that point, we only see the larger shells. This is punctuated equilibrium because it's stasis followed by a rapid change, followed by more stasis. So punctuated means like something that's been popped in the middle. And that's our rapid change that's been popped in the middle. And then equilibrium means it stays the same. So that's why we have stasis as well. Now, in all actuality, our fossil record is probably a combination of the two things. It's really hard to just fit it into one pattern. So punctuated equilibrium and gradualism are probably all part um, of, of our fossil record and how evolution has, has occurred as a pattern. Biogeography is something that we can use to help us look for patterns in the locations of fossils and living species as well. But we're looking at where these fossils occur location-wise on the globe. So they can give us information about where ancestral species, so ancient species, may have come from or how they may have traveled over time. So species don't just stay in one place. Um, lots of animals tend to migrate, um, whether they need to new have Blech. whether they need new food sources or they have to travel because there are natural disasters making them move, for whatever reason, they may have moved over time. And we can see in pictures like this, and I'll, I'll make it much larger in a moment, that we have fossil evidence of specific creatures on different continents in our globe, which is kind of crazy because they're separated by oceans and some of them are not water-dwelling species. So land animals somehow crossed between these continents millions and millions of years ago. So let's take a closer look. Let's have an example here of the Sig Sinonathus. Again, not a pronunciation that I'm super used to, but I'm going to go with Sinonathus. Um, and that is a Triassic land reptile. So it's a small... Uh, ish land reptile three meters long is about nine feet so i'm thinking something similar to a alligator size so we have that here however it's a land reptile so it did not live in the water and remains of it are found in south america and africa this was before we had boat travel before we had plane travel so that animal did not get on a plane and fly to africa 
it indicates to us that our Earth um, at one point had a much closer structure with our continents. Um, we call that Pangaea. It would be much easier for this um, land reptile to have crossed on a land bridge between South America, what, what is now South America and Africa, at some point. So we use a lot of these different um, kind of markers to show how the, the structure of the Earth may have been millions of years ago. It also helps us to see um, that these animals were capable of moving long distances, um, if, especially if their ancestors are found in different continents today because you may have some very closely related species found on completely different sides of the globe due to this Pangaea-like Earth structure. Now, biogeography um, was something that Darwin studied a lot, Charles Darwin. He was known as the father of um, evolution, natural selection in some ways. Um, and essentially, he was an explorer who traveled and made a lot of observations um, back in the 1800s, I believe. Don't quote me on that again. History, not my subject. But you can look up Charles Darwin if you want to. And some of his conclusions about biogeography were pretty simple. Um, at least they seem that way to us now. Species arrive on islands by moving across the water. That makes sense. If you don't move across water, you can't get to an island. So that one I was like, oh, gotcha, Darwin. Makes sense. Dispersal from nearby areas is more likely than distant sources. This also should make sense. Let me kind of deconstruct it. It means that, for example, if we are on the continent of North America and there's an island about five miles off the coast, it makes sense that a creature or an organism could come from North America to that island because it's five miles away. It's much more likely that happened than it coming from Australia, way further away. You think that animals are going to travel a much shorter distance than a longer distance if given the chance. So we're looking at them arriving from closer areas. So it, again, this should make sense. And I'll go over that again, because that's kind of a tricky one. Species that can fly, float, or swim can inhabit islands. So this, again, if you can fly, of course, you can get to an island. If you can swim, you can get to an island. If you can float, um, a lizard could theoretically get on a log and float over to an island. It's not ideal, but it can happen. Um, it's not something that would be happening all the time, but this is definitely something that could occur. Um, and a lot of times those colonizers or those first organisms that come onto a new island or a new land area, they can evolve into many different species. So you can have one common ancestor that is highly related to many, many, many new species that you see millions of years later. Let me kind of highlight this for us. So if we look at this picture, we see that we've got in this small one here, we've got these islands, the Canary Islands, we have Africa here, and then over here we see the tip of Spain, which would be Europe. So if we're thinking about where these lizard species most likely came from, because lizards don't just appear on islands out of nowhere, islands are volcanic, so they can't just appear in a volcano. They have to come from somewhere already established. So do, are we going to think that it's coming from Africa or Spain? What would be more likely? If we look at this here, Africa is fairly close to these islands. I mean, 100 kilometers is fairly close, I guess. Whereas Spain would be 1,000 or so kilometers away, probably several thousand kilometers away. It's much more likely that these lizards um, originally came over from Africa than it is that they came over from Spain because lizards don't swim very well. So those lizards would have a much harder time traveling to the islands from Spain than they would from Africa. So that's what we mean by dispersal from nearby areas is most likely. It's much less likely that they traveled from Spain all the way to those islands. Just doesn't make a lot of sense. Let's review what we've learned so far about the fossil record and biogeography. First off, when we talk about evolution as a concept, it's important to remember that we're talking about change over time. Now, time being millions and millions of years, and change being in a population of organisms, not a particular individual. As much as I might like to, I do not evolve over time like a Pokemon. It would be really cool, but I just don't. I develop and grow, but it's different from evolution as a whole. Now, fossils give evidence of change over time, but it's not a perfect picture. Um, we can have gaps, and there are a couple of patterns that fossils typically fall into. The first pattern fossils can fall into is gradualism. And this occurs when you have many transitional fossils and you start from one clear picture of one organism 
and you have many fossils in between leading to a clear picture of a second organism or species. On the other hand, punctuated equilibrium is a pattern of long periods of stasis or no change, followed by periods of very rapid change. So you'll have nothing for a while and then boop, something will happen and change and then nothing will happen for a while. So you may not see those transitional fossils that you see in gradualism. Biogeography is really closely related to the fossil record as it's really used as kind of a mapping technique. Um, you look at where different fossils have been found at different time periods to see how these um, organisms may have moved or how populations may have shifted over time. Um, it can also tell you interesting things about the way the earth was formed um, millions and millions of years ago because a land animal probably couldn't cross an ocean that exists today, but if the continents were close enough together, they could have made a way across. And that's it for us today. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe for more biology content. Um, why wouldn't you want to see more of me, obviously? Um, <laughs> and as always, I hope you had fun. I hope you learned something, and I'll see you later.